Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the January 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of the prospects of the Communist Party of Germany and the question of Bolshevization. An interview with Stalin by Herzog, a member of the German Communist Party, from February 3rd, 1925. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this file is referenced in the last file that I recorded, which was Mao talking about questions of leadership and the mass line. So I thought that we would follow up by just going ahead and reading it. It's pretty short. And in general, it's a good idea if you're interested in a particular piece of literature, follow down the footnotes. It's, you know, often you can get a lot more context and a deeper understanding of whatever subject it is just by doing the research on what works were cited. So anyway, historical context here. What was going on in Germany, 1925? Anything interesting? Yeah, definitely. These were the days of the Weimar Republic. So what was that? Well, recently, Germany had been one of the aggressors in World War I, 1914 to 1918. This was the first major clash between rival imperialists for who was basically going to rule the world in the 20th century. It was imperialists fighting amongst themselves to carve up all the various colonies and basically gain the rights to plunder and exploit different parts of the you know, less developed planet. It was a major crisis within imperialism, and what were the results? Well, the Russian Revolution in 1917 was one of them. There was also a near miss of a revolution in Italy. Basically, the socialist leadership there just couldn't get it together, and they had a revolutionary moment which passed without a revolution, and then what was the ruling class's response? Fascism. Fascism came just a few years later, Benito Mussolini, and basically uh, the bourgeoisie, although, you know, many of them are uncomfortable with fascism, they don't like the animalistic energy that it embodies, it's, they feel, the only way to avoid revolution and to preserve capitalism. So if they have to do it, they'll do it, although many of them are uncomfortable with it to some extent. Now, you know, I mentioned this sort of brutal energy of it. Um, why is that? Is it just because fascists are so virile? No, definitely not. It's because basically the project of fascism is taking the revolutionary energy of class struggle and the desire of the working class to remove the capitalists as the ruling class and to become the ruling class ourselves. It's taking that revolutionary desire and that energy and then spinning it into something else. So taking class struggle and turning it into racial struggle, uh, for example. So you get a lot of scapegoating and then national unity. What is national unity? Well, if we're trying to damp down class struggle and to sort of paper over class contradictions, what you're trying to do is say, hey, everyone in the nation of different classes, even though as Marxists, we know that there are irreconcilable contradictions between capitalists and proles because Literally, I mean, it's just very direct. What's good for them is bad for us. What's good for us is bad for them. It's diametrically opposed interests. This is why eventually in capitalism, the working class becomes class conscious, organizes, and opposes the ruling class. It's just uh, otherwise you keep getting crashes and capitalism is very unstable. Again, at some point, the working class realizes that society has outgrown capitalism and needs to move on into socialism. But so fascism, using again various things such as ultranationalism, will try to create a class collaborationist set of politics. You know, the national bourgeoisie and the national working class must come together for the sake of the nation against some other false threat that the bourgeoisie has cooked up in order to get the working class to unite with them instead of revolting against them as is our natural inclination and interest. So Germany was another sort of near-miss story. What happened after World War I in Germany? And before we get into this side note, every time there is a major inter-imperialist conflict, it usually results in revolutions. There hasn't been one in a very long time, which, I mean, is good or bad, depending on how you're looking at it. Had there been World War III, particularly a non-nuclear World War III, which 
really would be ideal because now with nuclear weapons, I mean, I feel like it's the nuclear weapons that sort of have prevented World War III because nobody can use them because they're so destructive. We could literally blow up the earth, I think, down to the core using nuclear weapons at this point. Um, so there hasn't been any you know, major conflict. I think that arguably this has also delayed the tide of world revolution, which has definitely stalled, you know, anyway. But so these crises of imperialism, uh, you know, World War I, you have some successful revolutions, the USSR, and then some not so successful ones like Germany and Italy. Then again, after World War II, half of Europe goes communist and, uh, you know, also China, Korea, etc. So anyway, getting back to Germany, uh, after World War I, what happens? Well, there was a very strong socialist movement in Germany, as one might expect. It was Karl Marx's birthplace. A lot of Marx and Engels' political agitation was oriented around Germany. And the Socialist Party of Germany did, in fact, date back to when Marx was alive. You would think, then, that this would be kind of a home base of socialism, like one of the first countries to go socialist, maybe. Except it wasn't. Why? Because poor leadership in the Socialist Party. If you have been through the basic Marxism-Leninism study guide playlist that we have up on the channel, you will have listened to Lenin's texts against opportunism in the Second Socialist International. So what happened here? Basically, during World War I, when the communists could tell that there was going to be some kind of you know, major imperialist conflict brewing, they could tell World War I was going to happen you know, without knowing the exact specifics of it, they decided ahead of time that should war break out between the imperialists, not to support one imperialist country or, you know, one national faction of imperialists over the other, but instead to use this moment of conflict to turn the working class against the capitalist class. So basically turn imperialist war into war against the imperialists, not have working people shooting each other. That's at least what they agreed ahead of time. And some socialist parties of different countries stuck to that. Others did not. They became opportunist. They sold out their working class to the capitalist class. And this was the case of the German socialists. So when the war was over, it was clear that Germany needed a new direction in terms of its government, what kind of a system it was going to adopt. Was it going to go Soviet? You know, was it going to have more radical communist leadership as, you know, the Russians had done and, you know, in the process of founding the Soviet Union? Or was it going to come under capitalist control again and be more of a social democracy? Well, there was the Spartacist uprising in January 1919, so 103 years ago this month when more radical communists had broken away from the Socialist Party and formed the Communist Party of Germany. These included people like Rosa Luxemburg, Clara Zetkin, and Karl Liebknecht, staged an armed uprising against the Social Democrats, the Socialist Party of Germany, who were in the process of establishing this basically bourgeois republic, which they thought, you know, under social democratic leadership, they could gradually turn into socialism or whatever. The KPD, the communists, were not having it, and so again, they staged an armed uprising to fight them for it, basically. They wanted to establish a Soviet-style workers' republic instead. Unfortunately, the communists were not successful, and the SPD, the socialists, had a lot of them killed. This is where the Bernie killed Rosa memes come from. So anyway, after the uprising was put down and the communists relented, the Social Democrats, the Socialist Party, um, basically continued about their business of building a social democracy. This was the Weimar Republic, 1918 to 1933. Then what happened? Well, you know, in Italy, it only took a few years between the missed opportunity at the end of World War I for a revolution and then the imposition of fascism in the country. In Germany, the same thing happened, except rather than three or four years, it was 15 but basically the same process. The Weimar Republic, this, you know, social democratic would-be paradise, was a disaster from start to finish, and it ended in 1933 when Adolf Hitler, the head of a not overwhelmingly popular, like, one thirty-three percent of the vote 
not overwhelmingly popular party, the Nazi party, was appointed, yes, not elected, appointed Chancellor of Germany by Hindenburg, the German president. And what then? Well, the Communist Party was outlawed, although it remained active in an underground capacity, and then 12 years of pain and genocide and warfare ensued under the Nazis' direction. Now, at the end of all of that, when Germany was defeated in 1945, half the country did go communist. Of course, this was East Germany. And if you're interested in that, another channel, Fellow Traveler, recently did kind of a long video about various aspects of East Germany. I'll put a link to that in the description. But for now, let's go into the text. That's a lot of context. It was like 10 minutes of context. Uh, and catch up with Germany in 1925. One last piece of context before we do. So I mentioned that the Weimar Republic was a disaster. It was very unstable from start to finish, high unemployment, all kinds of problems. Arguably, though, what really did it in was the crash of 1929, the beginning of the Great Depression. That was still several years out, so for now, the Weimar Republic had a bit longer to live, prompting this conversation between Stalin and Herzog from the German Communist Party. So... The first question, this is of course Herzog asking the questions, do you think that political and economic conditions in the democratic capitalist republic of Germany are such that the working class will have to wage a struggle for power in the more or less immediate future? Stalin, it would be difficult to give a strictly definite answer to this question if it were a matter of dates and not of trends. That the present situation, as regards both international and internal conditions differs substantially from that in 1923 needs no proof. That, however, does not preclude the possibility of the situation changing abruptly in favor of a revolution in the immediate future as a result of possible important changes in the external situation. The instability of the international situation is a guarantee that this assumption may become very probable. Second question. Considering the present economic situation and the present relation of forces, shall we need a longer preparatory period in which to win over the majority of the proletariat, the task which Lenin set the communist parties of all countries as an extremely important condition for the conquest of political power? Stalin. As regards the economic situation, I'm able to judge the matter only in light of the general data that I have at my disposal. I think that the Dawes plan has already produced some results which have led to a relative stabilization of the situation. There's a footnote there. The Dawes plan was the name given to the scheme for the payment of reparations by Germany, drawn up by an international committee of experts under the chairmanship of the American financier, General Dawes, and endorsed at the London Conference of Allied States on August 16, 1924. So basically about six months prior to this interview. Continuing, the influx of American capital into German industry, the stabilization of the currency, the improvement that has taken place in a number of highly important branches of German industry, which by no means signifies a radical recovery of Germany's economy, and lastly, some improvement in the material conditions of the working class, all of this was bound to strengthen the position of the bourgeoisie in Germany to some extent. That is, so to speak, the, quote, positive side of the Dawes plan. But the Dawes plan also has negative sides, which are bound inevitably to make themselves felt at some definite period and to demolish the positive results of this plan. Undoubtedly, the Dawes plan imposes a double yoke upon the German proletariat, the yoke of home and the yoke of foreign capital. The contradiction between the expansion of German industry and the shrinking of the foreign markets for this industry, the discrepancy between the hypertrophied demands of the Entente and the maximum ability of German national economy to meet these demands. All this inevitably worsens the conditions of the proletariat, the small peasants, office employees, and the intelligentsia, and it's bound to lead to an upheaval, to a direct struggle for the conquest of power by the proletariat. That circumstance must not, however, be regarded as the only favorable condition for a German revolution. In order that this revolution may be victorious, it is also necessary that the Communist Party should represent the majority of this working class, that it should become the decisive force in the working class. Social democracy must be exposed and routed 
it must be reduced to an insignificant minority in the working class. Without that, it is useless even to think of the dictatorship of the proletariat. If the workers are to achieve victory, they must be inspired by a single will. They must be led by a single party, which enjoys the indubitable confidence of the majority of the working class. If there are two competing parties of equal strength within the working class, a lasting victory is impossible, even under favorable external circumstances. Lenin was the first to lay special emphasis on this in the period before the October Revolution as a most essential condition for the victory of the proletariat. It could be considered that the situation most favorable for a revolution would be one in which an internal crisis in Germany and the decisive growth of the Communist Party's forces coincided with grave complications in the camp of Germany's external enemies. I think that the absence of this latter circumstance in the revolutionary period of 1923 was by no means the least important unfavorable factor. Third question. You said that the Communist Party of Germany must have the majority of the workers behind it. Too little attention has been paid to this aim hitherto. What, in your opinion, must be done to convert the CPG into such an energetic party with a progressively increasing recruiting power? Stalin. Some comrades think that strengthening the party and Bolshevizing it means expelling all dissenters from it. That is wrong, of course. Social democracy can be exposed and reduced to an insignificant minority in the working class only in the course of the day-to-day -day struggle for the concrete needs of the working class. The Social Democrats must be pilloried not on the basis of planetary questions, but on the basis of the day-to-day -day struggle of the working class for improving its material and political conditions. In this, questions concerning wages, hours, housing conditions, insurance, taxation, unemployment, high cost of living, and so forth, must play a most important, if not the decisive role. To hit the Social Democrats day after day on the basis of these questions, exposing their treachery, such is the task. But that task would not be fully carried out if those everyday practical questions were not linked up with the fundamental questions of Germany's international and internal situation, and if, in all its work, the party failed to deal with all those everyday questions from the standpoint of revolution and the conquest of power by the proletariat. But such a policy can be conducted only by a party which is headed by cadres of leaders sufficiently experienced to be able to take advantage of every single blunder of social democracy in order to strengthen the party, and possessing sufficient theoretical training not to lose sight of the prospects of revolutionary development because of partial successes. It is this, chiefly, that explains why the question of the leading cadres of the Communist parties in general, including those of the Communist Party of Germany, is one of the vital questions of Bolshevization. To achieve Bolshevization, it is necessary to bring about at least certain fundamental conditions, without which no Bolshevization of the Communist parties will be possible. 1. The party must regard itself not as an appendage of the parliamentary electoral machinery, as the Social Democratic Party in fact does, and not as a gratuitous supplement to the trade unions, as certain anarcho-syndicalist elements sometimes claim it should be, but as the highest form of class association of the proletariat, the function of which is to lead all the other forms of proletarian organizations, from the trade unions to the party's group in parliament. Comment there, that's the end of point one. I just want to say, note, that the Bolsheviks were not necessarily opposed to participating in bourgeois elections where it made sense to do so. What Stalin is pointing out here is that the Social Democrats really just see their party as, as he says, an appendage of the parliamentary electoral machinery. And then on the other end, the anarcho-syndicalists think that, you know, really the trade union should be center and the party is just sort of peripheral to them. But Bolsheviks regard the party as the central highest leading body that is supposed to, in fact, lead all of the other proletarian organizations, whether the trade unions or your elected delegates. And again, nobody thinks that you're going to be voting in socialism. The idea is if you can gain access to intelligence, if you can gain some kind of influence, whatever you can do using that power, then do it. You know, one of the problems in the U.S. right now, I can say living in the U.S., is that we don't have real elections here. 
in the sense that there's two parties that get elected and it's virtually impossible to get any other party elected except at, you know, maybe a city level or maybe a state legislature. The elections are not real in the sense of they're completely dominated by money. I mean, it's like every time the candidate that spends the most money almost always wins. I think it's like 95% of the time. The candidate that spends the most money wins, which basically means that in the U.S., you buy elections with about 95% accuracy, more or less. You know, you can be 95% sure that if you spend the most money that you're going to win. It might be a little lower, like closer to 90%, but really it is up there, like better than nine times out of 10. And it's a little bit different um, for the House versus the Senate. The Senate is a little less likely to go this way. It's still like 85%. The House is like almost 100% is like the most money spent wins. So elections are basically bought in the U.S. And that's one of many problems with U.S. elections. And I'm aware that there are problems with other kinds of parliamentary systems across the imperialist world as well. Point is, in 1924 or 25, it made sense to have this conversation. All right, continuing. Point two, the party, and especially its leading elements, must thoroughly master the revolutionary theory of Marxism, which is inseparably connected with revolutionary practice. Three, the party must draw up slogans and directives not on the basis of stock formulas and historical analogies, but as the result of a careful analysis of the concrete internal and international conditions of the revolutionary movement, and it must, without fail, take into account the experience of revolutions in all countries. 4. The party must test the correctness of these slogans and directives in the crucible of the revolutionary struggle of the masses. 5. The entire work of the party, particularly if social democratic traditions have not yet been eradicated in it, must be reorganized on new revolutionary lines so that every step, every action taken by the party should naturally serve to revolutionize the masses, to train and educate the broad masses of the working class in the revolutionary spirit. 6. In its work, the party must be able to combine the strictest adherence to principle not to be confused with sectarianism, with the maximum of ties and contacts with the masses, not to be confused with Kavastism, comment which is like a worship of spontaneity, basically a denial of the conscious planned element in revolution. Without this, the party will be unable not only to teach the masses, but also to learn from them. It will be unable not only to lead the masses and raise them to its own level, but also to heed their voice and anticipate their urgent needs. So commenting here, I think that this was probably the section that Mao was referencing in the questions on leadership file that we just did, among others, of course, but that was a pretty direct one, I think. Point seven, in its work, the party must be able to combine an uncompromising revolutionary spirit, not to be confused with revolutionary adventurism. Commenting, revolutionary adventurism is like when revolutionaries engage in acts of violence, whether it's guerrilla warfare or terrorism, which is not really closely connected with the mass struggle, it's not part of any sort of overall campaign that is well supported and integrated with the plan. It's just sort of like, hey, if we run way ahead of the masses and do this one thing, it'll, you know, catch us up. That's adventurism. So Stalin here is like basically contrasting foolish over eagerness that gets you into problems with just having a patient yet ready for anything and always ready to advance the current situation, whatever it is, revolutionary spirit. Okay. With the maximum of flexibility and maneuvering ability, not to be confused with opportunism. So commenting again, opportunism is basically abandonment of the proletarian interests. It's crossing the line to work with interests like the bourgeoisie with whom the proletariat is fundamentally opposed. So again, contrasting, you know, being flexible uh, in a way that's advantageous to maintaining your principles while being flexible about how you're exercising them with actually abandoning your principles in the name of, you know, flexibility, I guess. All right, actually, let me back up that sentence. So seven, in its work, the party must be able to combine an uncompromising revolutionary spirit, not to be confused with revolutionary adventurism. 
with the maximum of flexibility and maneuvering ability, though not to be confused with opportunism. Without this, the party will be unable to master all the forms of struggle and organization, will be unable to link the daily interests of the proletariat with the fundamental interests of the proletarian revolution, and to combine in its work the legal with the illegal struggle. 8. The party must not cover up its mistakes. It must not fear criticism. It must improve and educate its cadres by learning from its own mistakes. 9. The party must be able to recruit for its main leading group the best elements of the advanced fighters who are sufficiently devoted to the cause to be genuine spokespeople of the aspirations of the revolutionary proletariat and who are sufficiently experienced to become real leaders of the proletarian revolution, capable of applying the tactics and strategy of Leninism. 10. The party must systematically improve the social composition of its organizations and rid itself of corrupting opportunist elements with a view to achieving the utmost solidarity. 11. The party must achieve iron proletarian discipline based on ideological solidarity, clarity concerning the aims of the movement, unity of practical action, and an understanding of the party's tasks by the mass of the party membership. 12. The party must systematically verify the execution of its decisions and directives. Without this, these decisions and directives are in danger of becoming empty promises, which can only rob the party of the confidence of the broad proletarian masses. In absence of these and similar conditions, Bolshevization is just an empty sound. That's the end of Stalin's answer there. There is another question. I just wanted to comment, you know, looking at Mao's nine points that he made, it's definitely sort of a similar format there. Anyway, fourth question. You said that, in addition to the negative sides of the Dawes plan, the second condition for the conquest of power by the Communist Party of Germany is a situation in which the Social Democratic Party stands fully exposed before the masses and when it is no longer an important force in the working class. In view of actual circumstances, we're a long way from that. That is obviously the effect of the shortcomings and weaknesses of the party's present methods of work. How can these be removed? What is your opinion of the results of the December 1924 elections, in which the Social Democratic Party, an utterly corrupt and rotten party, far from losing votes, actually gained about 2 million votes? Stalin. That is not due to shortcomings in the work of the Communist Party of Germany. It is primarily due to the fact that the American loans and the influx of American capital, plus the stabilization of the currency, which have somewhat improved the situation, have created the illusion that the internal and external contradictions connected with Germany's situation can be completely eliminated. It was on this illusion that German social democracy rode into the present Reichstag as if on a white horse. Wells is now preening himself on his election victory. Evidently, he does not realize that he is claiming another's victory as his own. It was not the victory of German social democracy, but of the Morgan Group. Obviously referring to J.P. Morgan. Wells has been, and remains, merely one of Morgan's agents. That's the end. This was published in Pravda, number 27, February 3, 1925. So... What do you think? Uh, you know, that was a lot of background I understand on Germany, just trying to make sure everybody is somewhat on the same page as we have not covered Germany extensively so far on the channel. But anyway, hopefully the bits about Germany were interesting and useful. And then, of course, these points from Stalin about how to run an effective party uh, are also useful and educational. And definitely those 12 points, I think you take those and you take Mao's nine points Put them together on how does a party become relevant to the working class? Well, basically, you solve their problems. You become an important part of people's lives. It's the same way that corporations do it. You know, people look at a McDonald's logo or whatever, and they think, oh, reliable, warm food that, you know, keeps me full. I mean, it's also not good for you, and they're exploiting workers and whatever. But the point is, people have the problem, I need cheap food, and McDonald's steps in and says, Hey, here's cheap food. We have a dollar menu. But obviously McDonald's or any corporation is not really going to help you in social struggles. That's where the party comes in and says, Hey, what are you struggling with that capitalism isn't doing for you? That in fact seems to be making worse. We are here to help with that. We will help meet those needs. We will help you understand and overcome 
the social problems facing you. You become relevant in people's lives by being important, making important changes, doing things that substantially improve people's lives, that educate people, that house people, that feed people, that keep people safe, that empower people, that do the things that people are looking for. You know, you look across the working masses of any country, I'm in the United States, there are problems aplenty. I mean, it's like problems everywhere you look. So you talk to the people and you say, what do you feel like are the three biggest problems in your life that if you could fix them, your life would get much better? You know, what are your demands? I mean, first of all, just the act of asking people what they want, that's kind of like you can earn people's trust just doing that because most poor people in this country, no one ever asks us what we want. <laughs> so just the fact of being the first person to ask somebody is kind of remarkable. Somebody's liable to remember just that alone, let alone, you know, getting involved in that struggle, which previously felt so personal and lonely, but alleviating some of that loneliness, stepping in, helping people to figure out a strategy that's actually going to be effective, helping them accomplish the organization that's required in that process. You know, these are the things becoming important in people's lives means addressing the things that are important to people and forming a movement around that. And, you know, of course, operating the party, I'm going off a little bit from what Stalin was saying, but operating the party according to these kinds of principles that keep you on the right track as the party. So we've done a lot of processing today of sort of leadership type questions and having these discussions. I think that this is super interesting. I think that these are questions that pretty much every organization in my area needs to take a little bit more seriously because there just isn't enough community integration in a lot of places. I think that as the movement grows, which it is doing, we're going to see more and more of that. But, you know, I want everybody to keep that in mind. Studying the theory is important, but it doesn't really matter whether you've read, you know, five Hoja texts or 50. What matters is, can you get out there and apply any of this to actually leading the proletariat in struggle against the capitalists. That's the key thing. Like posting online, that is one part of it. You know, agitation and education online, it's important, particularly for finding the core of socialists who are really dedicated to studying the theory, to knowing the history and all that. But we need organizers and we need leaders if this is going to move beyond the words on a page kind of stage and bring it into reality and actually make the struggle come alive. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to wrap it up. What do you think? Leave a comment or a question in the comments area below, and we'll continue the discussion. I look forward to reading those. It's always an interesting time, and that is ongoing. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. They help me to stay motivated to keep doing this channel, keep making these videos. So thank you all very much for those. Other ways you can help out with the channel's growth, which it has been growing. It's excellent to see. Liking, subscribing, leaving a comment, even if it's just thanks or good video. All of that helps as well as sharing it on your social media, wherever you're online. All that helps to expand the audience and expand the conversation about ending capitalism by building an informed, class-conscious, organized proletariat. And on that note, and on the note of this entire thing, join an organization. Try to find something in your area that's active, healthy, connected with the community. People aren't fighting with each other or burned out or having screaming matches. Nobody wants to get involved with an organization like that. Again, see what's going on in your area, and I would say, particularly for people who haven't been in an organization before, just join the healthiest, most active thing you can find, gain some experience, and as time goes on, you can find something that is maybe more of a perfect match. At this point, with the state of organization in, well, the United States where I and most of the audience are, I think that, honestly, people just need more experience, and we need more people in organizations in general just getting used to to the culture of actually cooperating with people along class lines. All right, that's it for me for now. Thanks again for listening, and we will catch you in the next video.